Hello. Welcome, everybody, to the fifth session of Moving Towards Generational Healing. Today's title is Family and Interpersonal Relationships. As before, today's facilitator, again, is Zirit Felsen. I'm Toby Weiss, and we welcome you. Please uh, note that the sixth and final session will be on Monday, December 31st, also from 12.30 to 1.30. The title of that session will be Remember and Rebuild. I encourage everybody who's logged who has logged in or is dialed in to please send your questions or comments by typing into the chat box and we will leave time at the end of the session to go over all of the comments and answer any questions. Thank you and Irit, please. Hello, it's uh, great to be here again. Thank you for joining us. Um, as always, I have to start by stating that I have no financial disclosure. And today and uh, the next uh, and last piece in this series will focus on uh, primarily the implications of certain characteristics of the second generation and certain characteristics of the dynamics in families of Holocaust survivors, uh, their implications to our lives today, to our relationships, to what we can still do to make the present and the future uh, better. So I want to start today by uh, showing you a page from the graphic novel by Art Spiegelman, Maus. And if you can't read it so well, I'll read it out to you. It says, Artie, come to hold this a minute while, um, while I saw. And Artie comes to uh, his father who's doing something. And his father says, why are you crying, Artie? Um, hold better on the whatever. And he says, Artie says, I fell and my friends um, skated away without me. They didn't, uh, they didn't wait for him. And the father stops sewing and says, friends, your friends, if you lock them together in a room with no food for a week, then you could see what it is, friends. So what does this small interaction communicate to a child growing up in the safety of uh, America playing with his uh, friends, reading the children's books that we all read, in which friendship and, and all the uh, niceties of life are presented to children. What does a child understand from this kind of an interaction? That somehow all of these niceties that he reads about are different from what his father sees, that there is another reality that he, the child, is not really understanding is not really aware of, but it's a much more threatening reality, and it's a reality that his father knows and tries to warn him against, and that even his own, the child's perceptions of what are friends and what is happening in his life is somehow not to be fully trusted. Not only the friends are not to be trusted, but even his own perceptions are not to be fully trusted, because there is apparently this other reality so much more ominous, which he knows little of. That is a very good uh, example of what in much more sophisticated professional terms we would call certain deficits in relational competence, in parental relational competence, meaning the father here is introducing uh, content and, and emotional uh, load that is very disturbing it comes out of him automatically in response to events in the life of the child, and the response is really much more related to his own traumatic uh, history than, uh, than it is appropriate to the um, events in the life of the child. So these are trauma responses, uh, dysregulated trauma responses, dysregulated in the sense that the father doesn't really control them, he doesn't really understand what he's doing, when he's doing that, and they're not really appropriate and not in good fit with the here and now of the child. So I encourage everybody uh, to stop for a second already here and think about your own memories. Think if you can stop to remember examples of uh, reactions by our parents that seemed either extremely disproportionate to what was going on in our lives at that moment or to what was happening um, seemed out of context or otherwise were perplexing to you. 
Um, could you think about that particular incident that comes to your mind as an adult now and try to understand what exactly was going, was going on for your parent in that moment? Um, also, for some of us, uh, there would be times when um, we had parents who tried very much to shield us from their past, and there were still moments in which the response, whether it's a silence, whether it's a, a facial expression um, that was not talked about, but in response to something on the radio or something that came up in this way or that way, even a certain silence can communicate also a response that we registered as very potent. And lastly, think about yourselves now. Do you sometimes find yourself reacting in ways that are similar to the ways that your parents reacted? So in ways that are maybe disproportionate or, or not exactly in the appropriate to the context of what happened just in the here and now. Um, so, when we talk about the impact of, um, of these events in the relationship, which occur, like I gave you this example from Art Spiegelman's book, these events between children and parents occur on a daily basis, essentially, during daily simple interactions in family life, and they communicate what Hadass Weissman from, from Haifa called failed intersubjectivity, which is a sense in the child that they don't understand something, they don't understand the parents, they don't understand what's going on with the parents or why the parents are responding the way they are, and that they themselves are not well understood by the parent and not seen uh, by the parent in the way that they are uh, in the context of their own lives and what's important to them and what's happening to them and how they see their friends or their relationships, that, that all of it is not really understood well and seen or visible to the parents. So uh, some of the things that we talked about in previous sessions are important when we talk about our relationships today in the present with uh, the people that are important in our lives. Uh, some of these themes, um, for example, the um, need to protect the parents, which was a very potent theme in the lives of the second generation, um, might have interfered for many of us with a sense of autonomy and the permission to do what we want to do and what we um, uh, would like to do. The avoidance of conflict with the parents is something that we might have carried on into other relationships well into the present, uh, a difficulty um, stating what we want or wh where we were hurt, and, um, and difficulty handling hostile moments or hostile feelings in close relationships or in any relationship, which lead to either over-aggressive uh, ways of expressing ourselves or under uh, under expression, so uh, an inhibition and a difficulty saying to your boss, uh, no, I can't do that, or to your husband, I didn't like the way uh, you spoke to me just this minute, or any such thing. Uh, the wish for a greater emotional closeness with the parents, which was expressed by uh, many uh, children of survivors in describing their childhood or growing up uh, years, is something that may remain as a sense of longing for closeness that is um, perceived as almost not possible or a longing that cannot be fulfilled, but we have to uh, look a little bit better at can it be fulfilled now with the people that are in our lives, even if we didn't feel that it was uh, well enough uh, fulfilled in the past. And um, also, Part of that is that parents, uh, survivor parents, were perceived by their children uh, often as either too reactive to many things, overreactive, explosive even, but also as emotionally closed off. And while it may seem as a paradox, it really isn't because the overreactivity was to certain things, things that triggered anxiety, things that triggered traumatically um, loaded, you know, memories, the closed off uh, or detached feeling 
was more about uh, people, second generation individuals who describe a parent's inability to be excited enough about happy things that happened in their lives or uh, excited enough about uh, promotions, about the pregnancy of the child and, and about good things and feeling like the parent was not really interested enough or connected enough when it came to the normal and especially the happy and the good things about life. Uh, the focus of so on survival issues in the family atmosphere, uh, I will talk a little bit more about later on. So here is another um, book that I strongly recommend for all of us. Michelle Kishka is a cartoonist who uh, lives in Israel. He actually spoke at the UN last um, uh, last year about his book, his also his graphic novel, much like Art Spiegelman's. His is entitled The Second Generation, Things I Did Not Tell My Father. And as you can see, the front page and the cover of the book is himself standing on the podium, which is actually his father's Auschwitz uh, prisoner's cap which is a very strong statement about the main stage of his life being perceived as um, related to his father's Holocaust um, experiences. So in this uh, novel, Michel Kishka describes his uh, childhood, adolescence, his growing up in a life, in a family that was very much uh, overshadowed by the experiences of the survivor parent in his father in, uh, in the concentration camps. And it really also very poignantly addresses the, some of the difficulties and the love in the relationship between the father and his son. There is also a documentary that Michelle Kishka did, A Life is a, a Cartoon, uh, that addresses his relationship with his father. Um, some of the vulnerabilities, therefore, that we need to become aware of when we think of ourselves in our current relationships are the fact that the lack of open communication, communication that is uh, uh, about how we feel, about what we need, without fear of upsetting the parent or triggering the parent, without feeling that if we want something that might be a little bit upsetting for the parent, that we're being very selfish or very um, inconsiderate, uh, open the lack of open communication that allows such topics to be discussed might be something that we take into our patterns of communication with people close to us right now and the difficulty uh, being even in touch with our own needs and, uh, and, and of course expressing them might also be part of what we bring into our current relationships. Of course, when we can't speak of our needs, when we can't express openly how we feel, a lot of things can go wrong in communication and a lot of resentments and a lot of hurts can accumulate without being ever sort of dealt with and cleaned up. Also, uh, in my review of, uh, of uh, really a, a tremendous amount of research, including many, many doctoral dissertations that were not published as papers in North America, I identified um, a host of things in which we are different from our peers who are not Holocaust related. Um, higher scores on traits that are still within the normal range, what's considered normal range, it's not a clinical uh, level disorder, but we're still higher, we score higher on them. And those include anxiety, depressive symptoms, guilt, uh, hypervigilance, which is kind of like a mistrustfulness and always sort of being on the, on the alert for things that can go wrong, and um, interpersonal sensitivity, so a, a greater sensitivity to perceiving slights or, or being mistreated um, and, or, or treated not well, feelings of alienation, so feeling like we don't belong, we're different, and as I mentioned already before, an over control of aggression or an under control, so being a little bit too uh, easy to fly off the handle or a little bit too controlled in expressing appropriately that we were hurt or that we don't like something or something like that. So all of these higher 
scores, all of these things on which children of survivors score were seen in studies to score higher, really identify our vulnerabilities to react in these ways more often than other people, our sensitivity to perceive things in a certain way and to respond to them in one of these different ways that I just mentioned. And sometimes maybe if we're aware of it, we can stop to think, am I actually responding in this way because I have a bit of an extra sensitivity to this issue to respond in this way, or is it really appropriate for the here and now? We also have accentuated tendencies, uh, tendencies toward accentuated stress responses to um, serious challenges in life. So some um, higher frequency of PTSD was observed in children of survivors, even though there was no indication that they had more events that would be considered traumatic in their lives. So that kind of suggested that we might have a more catastrophic response to things that other people may not develop PTSD uh, in reaction to. And uh, that was also seen when comparing in Jerusalem um, uh, cancer patients, women who were cancer patients, um, compared women at the same stage of the disease and the comparison was between daughters of survivors and those who were not related to the Holocaust. And clearly, daughters of survivors' reaction to their illness was much, much more catastrophic, even though in reality, they coped with the illness very well. But their internal subjective experience was much more catastrophic than the experience of patients at the same level of the degree, uh, the same uh, level of the illness, the same diagnosis, who are not Holocaust survivors. Um, so this is something to remember that maybe we're reacting more catastrophically than we ought to uh, re-examine it, another important point for us to recognize as a vulnerability. Some of the issues that I just mentioned might be related to um, what is now known as epigenetics, the field, relatively new field, that looks at changes in the way that our DNA is expressed. And recently there was, a, uh, on, on 1210, there was a, even an article in the New York Times about it. Can we really inherit trauma was the title of it. I uh, feel that the review of the findings, the epigenetic findings that the author chose to review was a little bit skewed uh, over towards the um, conclusion that the findings are not yet uh, conclusive enough, but uh, even so, uh, there are enough findings suggesting that perhaps there are certain changes in the expression of our DNA that make us a little bit more susceptible to the stress reaction, as well as to other physiological changes related to the deprivation and the experiences that our parents experienced during the Holocaust. So how does it translate into our relationships Right now, we react like everybody else from our past in the present. We all do. It's a human tendency. So what we need to do is identify better our icebergs, as I called them last week, those deeply ingrained beliefs that were uh, created through our early uh, relational experiences, through our relationship with our parents, growing up in our family. We need to identify them and we need to think about them as a form of learning, a form of emotional and cognitive learning that took place in a particular context where it made sense. This is how we made sense of our environment. But now we live in a very different context, in a very different environment, and we need to reevaluate whether our reactions that might be derived from these old patterns, these old icebergs, still make sense in the current relationships that uh, we have and in the relationship with the people that, are, uh, that we live with right now. We must be able to uh, pay particular attention and be open to corrective feedback. So, for example, 
uh, if we're used to the fact that in our family there was no talking about conflict. If there was a conflict, if people were upset with each other, they were just upset with each other, and let's say they, they sulked and they didn't speak with each other, maybe they gave each other the silent treatment for two or three or more days, and then at some point it sort of dissipated then maybe we learn that that's the way it is. And if we have a conflict right now with the spouse, then that's what we anticipate. But our spouse may actually be someone who needs to talk about things when they happen. And that's the way that they resolve it. And they're very capable of listening to what we have to say. And in fact, feel very abandoned and very upset by our tendency to just sort of let it hang there but we are, of course, used to that, and we are uh, doing something that actually is hurting the relationship right now. That would be an example of an iceberg that doesn't work well and is inappropriate, in fact, damaging to the current relationship that we are in. Uh, we don't expect or we ought not to expect our partner to fix our previous uh, older wounds but be a good partner in the present, which means really be, both of us need to be open to feedback from each other about what works best for us now and, and try to be very responsible towards the relationship by taking in this corrective input and, and using it. And uh, part of that is the capacity to identify each other's strengths. We don't have to be the mirror image of each other. We don't have to be clones of each other. We need to be good partners who know the relative strengths of each other and can call forth these strengths in the other and in ourselves and divide things in such a way that we work as a good team, not as a competition, and not as uh, an expectation that the other person will be good at everything I'm good at, but really sort of work together as a team with the respective strengths and weaknesses. For that, we need to communicate. We need to learn to communicate constructively, which is something that many of us did not necessarily uh, practice much in our families. And communicating constructively means finding a way to say what we need to say in a manner that will allow the other person to really hear it. I say to my students, say it in such a way, teach your patients that they need to say it in such a way that it will go into the ear without hurting the ear, and in a way that is not just um, uh, serving the, the need to uh, express your anger or hurt, but express your anger and hurt in a way that will actually be constructive for the relationship in a way that will not just be hurtful, but will allow the other person to do better and to understand what you need them to do better. Uh, another point to be aware of is that sexual intimacy is often another casualty of trauma, and that's a whole other topic in and of itself, why even good couples uh, who are very happy with each other in many ways, when there is a uh, trauma in one of the partners or even transmission of trauma, uh, tr uh, sexual intimacy seems to be a particular domain in the relationship that is uh, hurt by it. And yet studies show us that sexual intimacy is very important for feelings of closeness in a couple as well as for feeling uh, vital and, and alive and lovable and um, all of those good things individually. So it's very important now in, uh, in middle age and even as we approach the later part of, uh, of our life to try to reconnect in that way because the couple is an incredibly important uh, aspect of uh, support, especially in the later part of life when our children are involved in their own lives when other sources of self-esteem and support that came from work and from engagement in a lot of other things uh, change, the couple is an incredibly important uh, relationship. So um, uh, going back to some of the issues that were important in the life of the second generation is that 
some enactments, as we call them, some repetitions or ways that in which we recreate issues from our childhood in our uh, relationships with other people later in life. For some, these enactments were, you know, momentary, such as uh, expecting the other person uh, not to be able to speak with us openly when uh, when we have or, or not being able to speak openly with the other person during a particular conflict or things like that. For some other people, uh, these enactments were much more, uh, much bigger and much more significant and really sort of eclipsed uh, the present. For example, I had several patients. In fact, once at a conference, at a uh, lecture I gave at a professional conference, another professional stood up and said, I never understood until I listened to this now that my um, choice to marry someone who had been widowed and, um, and be um, part of his life in many ways was uh, very repetitive to my sense that my life as the child born to a survivor who lost already a family before, that that sense of being a, a an appendix, as she put it, to the main book, the book being the life that was before and her, the appendix to the book, that that was some very profound theme that, uh, that she had reenacted. So what we see in marriages of the second generation, some of the studies that addressed it, is actually uh, that there were some differences, um, some characteristics that we need to be aware of, which is that daughters of survivors in a very uh, well-controlled study in Israel showed uh, much more problematic relationships with their partners, a tendency uh, to enter these marriages uh, from the beginning in, in a much more ambivalent way. So it's almost what I, I interpreted almost uh, seeing so many people in my private practice and in my personal relationships that fit into that category, category women who married um, someone with whom the relationship had already been ambivalent from the beginning. I see it almost as a very good compromise uh, solution between two impossible wishes the wish to bring the parents naches and to make, a, all, to, to make a life the way the parents would have liked it and give them grandchildren and all of that. And at the same time, the sense that one cannot really um, love somebody else as much as we ought to love our parents and be as loyal and as connected with the other person, that that would be some kind of almost a disloyalty to the survivor parents. And... Um, and also the fact that, as the study showed, many, many daughters of survivors lived lives as a married uh, person and as a parent led their lives in a much more intertwined uh, way with the lives of the parents, which often also caused a lot of um, conflict in the marriage, a lot of internal conflict in the, in the daughter herself feeling pulled between all of these different uh, demands to be a wife, to be a good daughter, to be a mother, and where where should one be and where should one put one's energies first. So um, um, the parenting of the second generation, given their own experiences being parented by their survivor parents, was also a somewhat complicated task, and studies show that uh, as a group, the second generation is very tend to be very highly committed to the new families that they create, but they also express uh, higher levels of tensions uh, involved with the parenting uh, task and uh, higher levels of anxiety and a, diff a higher sense of um, lesser satisfaction with themselves um, as parents and a lesser degree of responsiveness to um, their own, lesser degree of flexibility in their responsiveness to their own children. The third generation, we are now already looking at them reaching young adulthood. They were seen to be overrepresented in a child psychiatric clinic in, um, in Canada relative to the proportion of the third generation in the general population. And uh, parents and teachers 
report higher levels of uh, fearfulness, neurotic behavior, aggression, social behavior, and inhibition. Um, and also, uh, in a much more recent study from uh, 2012, um, findings show, showed higher levels of uh, stress and um, lower differentiation of self, which means a lower capacity to sort of think for yourself and feel autonomous in connection with the people that matter most to you in your life, such as parents and uh, spouses and intimate partners and so on. At the same time, there are also contradictory findings, such as the fact that in another study, um, the third generation was rated higher by their parents in self-esteem and coping, and lower on behaviors that indicate uh, severe psychopathology. So how we understand these various uh, contradictions is by much more recent studies that show basically that uh, children in uh, families where only one parent is the child of survivors were not really different from children whose families are not Holocaust related at all, but children in families where both parents were children of survivors did show some significant differences. And that is in a, you know, for example, in a big study in Israel that, uh, that looked at a large, um, a large um, cohort of uh, kids finishing high school and going into the army. And they were seen, uh, they saw the third generation in that study, saw their parents who are second generation as much less accepting and encouraging independence. They had less positive self-perceptions, which is often the case when children feel that their parents are or when children grow up with parents who are less accepting and encouraging of autonomy and independence, oftentimes it makes children have a less positive self-perception and less confidence. And they were also um, rated according to their peers as uh, a little less well adjusted during Pironut or the um, basic military training in Israel. They also expressed more anxieties about the potential repetition of traumatic events um, reminiscent of the Holocaust. So these are interesting findings that are really a little bit alarming in terms of the transmission of effects related to the Holocaust uh, trauma in the lives of grandparents to the third generation. So all of these things are really uh, issues that we need to be aware of because we can still change some things. The relationship of young adults with their parents have been shown in studies that I didn't include here to change well into adulthood still. The relationship with parents are very meaningful and significant and impactful well into adulthood. So if we as second generation uh, are aware of these sensitivities and vulnerabilities in us and in the third generation, we still can become much more reflective and much more able to introduce changes by modeling and by talking about it and by just the way we are in our own lives and in our relationship with our adult children. We can still impact change also in those relationships and for them in their own lives. The way we also understand differences, as, as you well know, when we look at our own families, the second generation, you can often see great differences between siblings who grew up in the same family. And I often get asked about it, how come my brother is so different, I'm this way, my brother is so different, or I'm this way, my sister is so different. And we have come to understand it as a very um, normative process that is accentuated in families of Holocaust. So the normative process is that siblings differentiate themselves from each other. You're like this, I'll be like that. You're good at that, I'll be like that. Your relationship with the parents is like this, my relationship will be like that. That's a normative process of sort of carving their own niche, becoming their own person, and de-identifying from the other sibling as a way of uh, defining their own unique self and their own unique place in the family and in the relationship with parents. However, 
As I mentioned briefly before, and I said I will uh, talk about it a little bit more later, families of Holocaust um, inevitably have a certain um, um, sensitivity to survival issues, and survival issues have a way of sort of floating in the atmosphere of the family this way or another. And the awareness to the parents' suffering is very much there. The need to protect the parents is very much um, seen as a big concern or psychological theme in the life of the second generation. So all of these things combine together to make siblings develop very different ways of how each of them feels they are fulfilling parental expectations, spoken and unspoken. And because they are so different, the differentiation can also create a lot of resentments between them. And those differences are uh, accentuated by the fact that it is so important to protect the parent from pain. It is so important to not cause the parent more anxiety. It is so important to fulfill the parent's expectations that it kind of pushes people to, uh, to more polarized differences. And it also, the, the, the issues of survival in the family are woven into it by such statements as, you know, when somebody sees the, spa, the partner, sorry, the sibling doing something that they feel is very hurtful to the parents, you get expressions such, my brother is killing my parents by sharing his tr trouble and problems with them, or my, my sister is, is driving my parents into an early grave with the uh, whatever it is that she's doing. Uh, and so that is the, the way that the, the survival issues sort of express themselves and, and, and polarize the resentments between siblings for the differences in the way that they behave, in the way that their relationship with the parents are. However, you know, we do, I do think that it's incredibly important at this point. So I will start, actually, I will take a step back and say that in my work, uh, over many years with children of survivors, I noticed a very high frequency of relationship cutoffs, especially, of course, um, after the parents pass away, but after the survivor parents pass away, but also sometimes before, which is extremely painful for the survivor parents. They already lost their so many people from their original family and now they have this new family that they established and to see siblings, their own children, not speaking with each other is extremely painful. I was once interviewing a survivor in her home when there was a knock on the door and I was quite close to the door so I was a bit perplexed when I heard a man ask her, are you alone? And her answer was yes. And then the man walked in and went into the back of the home where uh, his sick father was, uh, was being taken care of. And the survivor mom sat next to me and said, this is the greatest tragedy of my life. He and his brother have not spoken in 15 years. And if I had told him that his brother is here, he would not have stepped into the house. So this is a very tragic thing that happens in, in Holocaust families. And the tragedy is also that when we look at some of the painful issues that second generation describe about growing up as the children of Holocaust survivors, one of the painful thing that they, things that they point out is the lack of um, generational continuity, as Danielle and her colleagues uh, uh, observed and called it, the lack of extended family, the lack of grandparents, the lack of uncles and aunts and, and cousins. And so uh, it's very important for us not to contribute as best we can to the reenactment and re, uh, re repetition of this rupture in family relationships, which means we should try as best we can to avoid relationship cutoffs and to allow the opportunity for the third generation to have relationships or to develop relationships 
with their cousins at least, if not with their uh, uncles and aunts, even if we ourselves cannot repair the relationship or make them better with our own siblings. Um, I wanted to show you this gorgeous uh, art by Valerio Beruti about siblings. Uh, we do see in, uh, in uh, studies of siblings, a lot of studies by the British researcher Judy Dan, Dan uh, that absence of parental availability can lead in siblings uh, growing up together in their relationships to either um, increase mutual support and closeness or to the opposite, which is so beautifully uh, expressed in these um, drawings by Beruti. So, and that's what we also see in families of Holocaust survivors, either an increased closeness or uh, its opposite. So we did speak about that, and again, I wanted to uh, highlight that the importance of working on our relationships in uh, mid uh, midlife and in the later part of life cannot be overemphasized. There is a very outstanding, unusually uh, great study that has been uh, conducted at Harvard University for a very long time now, over 80 years. It started as the grant study, and it is now um, still going on. Uh, for At this point, uh, out of the people that uh, were the, the college students, at Harvard that participated in it originally, only about 15 are still alive, and they're in their 90s. And uh, of course, following these people, these men, because Harvard at the time was not co-ed, uh, following these men for so many years has allowed us a lot of insights into their crises, their successes, the way that they navigated life. And the findings are pretty um, amazing. So I will quote uh, Robert uh, Waldinger, the director of the study, saying the surprising finding is that our relationships and how happy we are in our relationships has a powerful influence on our health. Taking care of your body is important, but tending to your relationships is a form of self-care self too. That, I think, is the revelation. And that's why it is so, so important at this point to work on it. Now, studies of um, counseling with, the, with older individuals, counseling with uh, people in the later part of life, certainly shows the importance of the quality of one's relationship with, this, with spouses, with partners, and with adult children, the importance of that to uh, the well-being of uh, older adults. So we really have um, something that is really worthwhile looking at and improving um, as soon as we can. So the, I will only um, say a few things about uh, our um, observations about the second generation and aging, and then I will stop at 120 so that we have some time possibly for interactive uh, discussion of comments and questions that might have come in during, the, during this um, recording. So we do see that in the life of the second generation throughout life, throughout the studies that covered many, many of our um, phases uh, growing up, that vulnerabilities tend to express themselves at points of transition in life. So these were adolescence, or how we adjusted and navigated moving out of our parents' homes, um, marriage, parenting, the stress of war in Israel, or facing a, ser a serious illness, as with the cancer survivors that I uh, mentioned before. The, uh, the age the age, um, the middle age is associated with certain changes as well, and uh, an older uh, and the older years are accompanied often by certain changes and losses and challenges, such as children moving out, such as changes in one's work life, such as loss of friends, siblings, even spouses or children. All of these things are potentially very powerful triggers for some of the issues that 
are vulnerable and sensitive in children of survivors. So our difficulties with separation um, and, and, and um, uh, moving away from people that we love can obviously be triggered by children moving away, by children getting a job on the other side of this very large continent, or even by changing family relations, which can occur as a natural process of uh, change in the relationship between parents and children who have become uh, older and adults themselves, children who have become parents themselves. Sometimes the um, uh, inclusion of uh, uh, people from outside the family that our children marry can influence uh, many changes in our relationship with them. All of these things can actually be triggers and feel like losses that we are very sensitive to. In fact, um, in a study from uh, uh, Brazil, the, uh, the author stated that changing relationships in the family might signify symbolic loss of the child or even a death of the family in a sense, a death of the family as we saw it, as we wanted it to be. And um, on the other hand, in a study from Israel, second generation individuals were seen to express a higher sense of subjective well-being while at the same time reporting uh, greater physical health problems. And it was hypothesized that we, like our survivor parents, have the capacity to sort of push down and ignore all kinds of uh, preliminary signs of some health problems because of our hardening that I mentioned in previous um, meetings here, our capacity to push through even when we're tired or when something aches a little bit or hurts a little bit, which is a capacity we have learned and internalized from our survivor parents. But it means maybe that we don't pay attention to certain signs when they begin and then we have uh, bigger problems, whereas our peers who may be uh, notice the signs earlier and go to take care of them earlier, um, have less serious health problems once we age. So that's again something to pay attention to and an encouragement to treat um, and, and improve as best we can. I will stop here for today and we'll go to your questions and comments. Thank you so much for being with me again. And uh, Toby, can you Yes, thank you so much, Yurit. Um, some of the questions revolve around um, really what the title is today, family and interpersonal relationships, but with a focus on takeaway messages, the teaching moments. So for example, you discussed accentuated stress reactions which were defensive reactions to parental relationships. Can these also lead to what uh, uh, are often known as rebellious behaviors in the yes. second generation? Yes. So, so, it, yes. so that's a great question that is very, very important because not all of us have developed the um, the, the way of being with our parents, which was, you know, to put their needs ahead and to do what they want and to forego our um, wishes and all of that. Some of us actually became uh, the rebellious children and those who fought very hard against that sense of intrusion and, and uh, suppression by the parents' uh, Holocaust uh, uh, legacy. And these people now, um, okay, uh, it's, a, it's a really good question, which I will make sure also to go back to if I need uh, next week with regards to the differences between siblings. Because often what we have is the two uh, polarized ways of being in the same family. One that was very um, accommodating to the parents and very, um, very much protecting the parents in that conventional way. And then another sibling who maybe uh, was very rebellious or another sibling who went far away and, and, and disconnected, relatively speaking, and pursued their ambitions and did 
and, mar and married out of the faith or did a lot of things very autonomously and very much not necessarily in the way the parent would have liked it to be. And that so, is part of what I talked about in terms of the polarization. But what's very important to understand is that parental expectations in our families, some of them were explicit and, and, and stated and some of them were not. And sometimes the rebellious kid, especially if it was a son, you know, there was an inherent contradiction between social expectations for men to go out into the world, to achieve, to be independent, to be autonomous, especially in this country, you know, with the John Wayne kind of, you know, myth of the hero, as it's called in, uh, in sociology and in, and in, uh, and in uh, family therapy, or in Israel, the Sabra, you know, you have to be very independent, very strong, and then on the other hand, the expectation somehow in the family to not hurt the parent, to not cause anxiety, to not upset the parent, and these things contradict. So for some people, many times the male children of survivors, or so sons, they had to be rebellious because doing anything that was a little bit expansive, that was a little bit expansive with an A, not with an E, expansive, and independent and autonomous and taking risks was very anxiety arousing for the parents and immediately created terrible conflicts and a sense that you're being very bad and, and causing that dynamics of uh, the rebellion and the... And the um, to 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 be started so yes we see that a lot too did that answer the question yeah that was yeah very very much so there's a there's a few questions um, again they revolve uh, in great measure around concrete strategies uh, learning moments so one of the questions is how can we avoid the sense of victimization that comes from understanding ourselves better? Can we change the way we, we react and deal with things? So this is a theme. This, how, how do we self-regulate? And how do we, through the process of self-regulation, self avoid the sense of victimization and learn how to deal with things in a healthier way? Right. So this is truly the, the bottom line uh, goal of uh, this series, and I certainly will make a point of focusing on it, if anything else, in the last uh, meeting next time. Okay. The point is to identify the vulnerabilities, not just for the sake of documenting them or, or you know, but in, in order to become much more aware of what they are because of two things. One, in general, uh, the whole point of the capacity to change in therapy is that if we become aware of our vulnerabilities, if we become aware of how they came to be, what was their point, how they made sense at some point, and therefore accepting it, embracing it, recognizing why it made sense and why it may no longer make sense, we can intentionally focus our attention and our energy and our newfound capacities as adults. We can focus them and, and sort of intentionally know what we need to pay attention to when we react automatically in a certain way to immediately be able to connect it somewhere to this new knowledge. And um, if not, you know, we don't change just by recognizing that something is uh, related to our childhood vulnerabilities. No, but we, if we begin to be able to take that step back, to own it when it happens, even if it's after the fact, to own it, to acknowledge it, to apologize, to repair the damage, gradually we do change. Gradually patterns change because we change, because the other people around us respond to us differently, because everything in relationship is reciprocal. So that's one thing. The other thing is studies of adult development have shown that when we reach middle age and after, 
we actually really do gain what's called wisdom. And what is wisdom? Wisdom in the way that we see it in studies is the capacity to no longer see things in black and white. To be able to hold in your mind at the same time multiple perspectives, multiple truths, so to speak, and see the multiple sides of, of issues, your side, my side, that allows us also to do a much better job with these things. So if we put all of that um, new strength, new ability into use by intentionally focusing on our vulnerabilities as things that we need to become more reflective of and, and do differently with, it does actually change. Our brain is a social organ that is continuously capable of change. Thank you. Um, I want to respond to one request that came in, and then I'll ask you the last two questions that I think we will have time for. It's 126. Somebody asked that all of the materials be sent to an email address. Uh, I want to make uh, everybody aware of the fact that all of these sessions are being recorded, have been recorded, and are accessible after uh, 24 hours after the, the live session. And you will be able to get all PowerPoints from accessing that. Go to www.mjhs.org slash healing. And that will open you up to the landing page with all of the sessions. You'll be able to access all materials. Okay, so t two questions, one actually links into another. So in families where second generation children are characterized as good or bad, as successes or failures, uh, how can these siblings post loss of that Holocaust survivor parent reconcile their relationship so that they establish a healthier future, present and future relationship as siblings. Let me ask the next question because I think that they can, they perhaps may be linked. Do you see a difference between siblings born immediately after the Holocaust or those that were born 10, 12 years later? Mm -hmm. And can you connect those? Yes. So the questions are indeed very close together. I don't know if I'll be able to do a good job of uh, giving a full answer to this because this is really incredibly important. Yes, there are many, many families where the polarization in the roles of the siblings have led to, you know, one being the bed or the failure or the schlemazel, as I refer to it in some of my talks, and one being the success. I, I wanted to speak again about the... Uh, implicit and the explicit expectations in trauma-impacted uh, families. So there are explicit expectations that, uh, and, and by the way, uh, also a concept that I sort of went uh, uh, over and did not stop over, of the differential susceptibility of children to different aspects in the relationship with their parents and to different events in the life surrounding the family. So one child, what is differential susceptibility? One child can be much more susceptible and much more incorporate the uh, parental expectation. You know, I didn't get to go to become a doctor. I didn't get to uh, become, uh, you know, to get higher education. I didn't get to make the kind of success in life that I could have you go ahead and do it. So they go and they do it. But you know, in order to become successful in these ways, you also need to go to whichever medical school accepted you. It might be on the other side of the country. And if you go to the other side of the country to all those years in medical school, you might marry someone there and stay there. And so you become a success in certain ways. But in certain ways, you also took yourself away from the family. You're not by the parents. You're not the one taking them to their doctor's appointments. You're not the one there uh, asking them how they are doing and, and doing little things for them or bigger things for them all the time. You come to visit, and you are the success in some ways, but you're also the one who abandoned in some other ways. And then there is 
sometimes the one um, uh, characterized as the less successful or the failure, who stayed much closer geographically, who didn't go far away. Maybe when the parents didn't want them to go to a far away college, they went to the nearby college. Maybe they didn't even go to college or dropped out because they were so impacted in their sense of autonomy or uh, whatever. They, or maybe they did go to college, but, and maybe they even have a, a, a great uh, education and a great uh, job, and maybe they even got married, but they're this daughter that we saw in the studies that kept living a life much more intertwined with the life of the parents. And they're nearby, and their professional choices, and their marital life, and their choices about how to be with the children or with my parents, or uh, should I do, uh, should I go away with my husband now, or can I leave my parents now, or all of those choices were determined by the uh, supremacy of the need to take care of the parents, and you know, if that's what we do, then sometimes we forego certain better professional opportunities, and maybe we don't make as much money, and we even need some financial help from the parents, because we didn't take that higher paying job that would have taken us further away, and maybe our marriage suffered from it because we were too intertwined with our parents, and so the marriage maybe uh, suffered, maybe it's not good, maybe it ended in divorce, and so this person is the failure. But really, we had to understand that that person was very susceptible and very much internalized, perhaps less well uh, expressed, verbally less expressed wishes of the parents, stay near me, don't abandon me, take care of me, I'm so lonely and I'm so depressed when my children leave me. And that person has responded to those parental expectations that might have been explicit or implicit. If it's the case of a son and a daughter, then oftentimes gender, which is a very powerful differentiating element in life, uh, the son will go with the expectation, go achieve, make a success, and the daughter was the one who stayed more nearby and took care of the parents and maybe uh, paid the price for that. The son who went away and succeeded, and in families where it's the two, the two children are of the same gender, then the child who went away and succeeded also pays a price. They pay the price of being um, seen as abandoning on some level and, uh, and, and all kinds of things that go along with that. So I think if we understand that each sibling in the family responded to the stress of parental trauma in a different way and tried to give the parents something very important that they perceive the parents as needing, if we understand that everybody took their path not out of lack of care, but in many ways uh, as a way to, um, to fulfill parental expectations, and that each path had its cost, then maybe we can forgive each other a little bit for things and not see, you know, because usually the one that stayed close by feels very angry that they're the ones who carried most of the burden of the care of the parent, and not only that, but they see the other sibling as having hurt the parents very badly by abandoning, by not being uh, emotionally close to them. The other one, on the other hand, the successful one, often feels that the one that stayed nearby um, has drained the parents in other ways. Yes, took them to the doctors, yes, took care of them, but maybe also drained them uh, emotionally and financially um, because of their problems. So they're very angry about that because they feel that they went, they gave up parental support, they never burdened the parents with their issues or problems, they never asked for a penny, they made it all by themselves, and this one who stayed nearby needed help and told the parents about all their problems, and each of them thinks that the other one kills the parents or killed the parents or drained the parents. And the intensity of these resentments, as I said, is fueled by the sense that, really, it's not a metaphor that they're killing my parents, he's killing my parents. It really is felt this way. Hey, Re, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's oh, I'm very, so sorry. 
It's a very, lo it's a loaded topic. We can go back to it. Yes. Um, I think we need to end because we're already at 135. There was one request. I think you could answer this because it will take literally 30 seconds. Um, uh, there were two acronyms, two abbreviations that you had in the PowerPoint, and somebody asked if you could just state what HOF and STS oh, are. And then we're going to end. Sorry, HOF is my personal uh, acronym for 2G, second generation. And STS? Stress, stress response. Okay, thank you. So uh, a lot of these questions are really very, very charged uh, for a lot of people. So I'm going to ask now that we're ending again, uh, please, those of you that will be returning on the sixth sex at the sixth session on December 31st, which is on Remember and Rebuild, please bring your questions, bring your comments. If between now and December 31st you have questions that come up for you, send them in because this will also help uh, build them into the presentation for next time. Thank you all for joining us. Please share this information with those that for whom it is relevant. And Irit, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much.